Hey there, Broadmoor family, friends, guests, however you arrived at our YouTube channel today, we're just really glad you're here. It's Sunday, June 20th. Summer solstice is upon us. Warm weather is upon us. The second stage of our restart plan in our province is upon us. All these great things converging into one. But what's even greater is just the opportunity for us to gather, whether remotely or in person, for some of us will be meeting in person as you are perhaps viewing this particular YouTube video, uh, to worship the Lord. And so we invite you into worship and we welcome you here today. The call to worship is from Deuteronomy 32, chapter one, verses three and four. Listen, O heavens, and I will speak. Hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. I will proclaim the name of the Lord. Oh, praise the greatness of our God. He is the rock. His works are perfect, and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he. Come, let us worship in song. Before the day, before the light, before the world revolved around the sun, God on high stepped down into time, wrote the story of his love for everyone. He has to worship. We're forgiven and free. What wonderful truths. Will you pray with me? Gracious and loving Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to express in our hearts um, what we think of you, what, what worth, your value. We worship you. We ascribe worth. And we thank you that 
when we embrace surrender, when we choose to believe, we discover who we were meant to be as your children, as your people, kingdom people. Gracious God, we, we go through a lot of things in our world, and while we're grateful for a return to what seems to be our new normal or a start to that return, we recognize a lot has been lost. Sometimes people have been lost, sometimes jobs have been lost, sometimes just even our own uh, ability to be free from fear has been lost. And so we just pray that in these moments as we continue to worship you and live for you that we would indeed place our entire trust in you so that we would be freed from, liberated from any and all fears. Guide our steps, we pray, Lord. Thank you for who you are and what you've done for us to enable us to have a relationship with you impress that anew, afresh, or perhaps for the very first time in our hearts today. In Jesus' name.
Our scripture reading this morning is from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 28 and verse 33. And we were reading from the New International Version. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after cupper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread or drink from the cup. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus' words always ring very loudly when I think of these moments. And picking up on last week's theme of having reminders to remember the important things of life, it occurred to me that the, in, the, in the Lord's table, the moment of communion, as we sometimes call it, there is a vivid reminder to remember. So I'd like us to spend time in the text that focuses our attention on what to remember. The passage in 1 Corinthians 11 is the one biblical account of any length that discusses the actual conduct of the Lord's Supper amongst the gathered people of God. And so I'd like, that's the reason why I like coming back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 whenever we participate in the table together. And while we didn't read from verses 17 to 22 in advance of this, which, where it speaks of the negative side of what happens when the people of God come together and do things incorrectly, just note that for now. We'll pick it up in a, in a little while. Um, it becomes part of the reason, the large part of the reason why Paul writes at length about the Lord's table. To elicit remembrance of the person and work of Christ so that we will never forget. There are different ways that people remember. I'm not referring to tricks to help you remember things like mnemonic devices or word pictures and the likes, but the emotional ways in which we remember things, that we remember people, that we remember places or events. For example, since I spent uh, many of my formative young Christian years working at a summer camp just north of Princeton, B.C., every time I go there, every time I drive that road, uh, waves of nostalgia flood or wash over me. I almost get butterflies even uh, when I think about that road. And it's wonderful. It's a way I remember. Sometimes we remember loss with both mixed emotions of both Sorrow and joy. Sorrow because a piece of us is, is missing. But joy in the memories of the good things that we encountered in life. And we certainly celebrate birthdays and anniversaries and things with exuberance, with, with excitement and singing and cake and presents and all those great things. We remember so fondly the good moments. And I really do hope that you have those kinds of memories in your own life, the good moments. Like, because I know that not everybody, not everybody 
has had a great childhood or a great upbringing, but I pray that you find those moments of hope, those moments of joy, those moments where you can remember fondly, have those waves of emotion come over you that just give you peace or that excite and enthuse you in, in, in times of remembrance. But when it comes to the Lord's table, when you see the table set, when you enter into the facility, the worship service, into the sanctuary, and you see the table set, prepared for you to receive. What are the emotions that wash over you? What are the feelings? What are your thoughts in those moments? What do you remember? Of course, we remember Jesus' death. His body, the bread. We break bread, and as we break bread, we remember, do this in remembrance of me. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We pour the cup, his blood, the wine, broken and poured out all for love. We say, do this in remembrance of him. There might be a variety of ways in which you are, your emotions are engaged in the moment, in, in that, that remembering. It's a table of mystery for some not really being certain of why it's there and what it's trying to succeed in doing. I've mentioned before, when I was a young Christian, I really didn't know what to make of the table. I just thought it was something you did once a month quickly at the end of the service because you, you just kind of had to. Um, after all, the real worship was complete and before you got to head to the foyer for coffee and cookies. I've since learned that that is not the case. It's a table of deep and rich symbolic and spiritual meaning for others. A belief that in participation, it becomes a means of grace. As Richard Barcelos writes, the means of grace are the delivery systems God has instituted to bring grace. That is, spiritual power, spiritual change, spiritual help spiritual fortitude, spiritual blessings to needy souls on earth. He goes on to write, The Lord's Supper is a means of grace through which Christ is present by his divine nature and through which the Holy Spirit nourishes the souls of believers with the benefits wrought for us in Christ's human nature, which is now glorified in heaven and at the right hand of the Father. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16, Paul himself says, after all, is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? We sometimes call it communion because in this act we have spiritual union. We commune with God. That word participation in the 1 Corinthians 10 verse I just quoted is that Greek word koinonia, which means fellowship or participation or partnership. Communion. In these moments when we participate in the table, we commune with God. So what do you see? What do you remember? What I hope you remember, or perhaps learn perhaps for the first time, is that it is not just a tradition, just something we do from time to time, or only a memorial that we tack on to the end of a service once a month before we get to the coffee and cookies kind of thing. Yes, words of memorial are etched into the event because we do this in remembrance of Jesus. And whenever we eat the bread or, or drink the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. But a man, as a man by the name of David Heddle once wrote, when, when, when reduced to merely an ordinance, baptism and communion are no longer about what God does, but what humanity does. There is nothing supernatural occurring, as if the supernatural realm were off limits to the creator of the universe, God merely observing as we commemorate his work. An ordinance, he claims, is actor-centered. 
And so if it's just an ordinance, if it's just something we act out, something we perform, is it void of God? I believe God is present in the table and in the moments that we spend at it. Just like I believe God is present whenever we make his presence known in our homes and in our workplaces and in our community. There is something solemn, something specific, significant, something deeply spiritual in participating in the table that I don't want you to ever forget. So what then are we to remember? Besides the very obvious that we remember Jesus' body given for us and Jesus' blood shed on the cross for the remission of sins. As I've reflected before in an extended table moment looking at this passage, um, sometimes we might do well just to imagine uh, sitting with Jesus, having conversation with Jesus. He says, when he says, do this in remembrance of me, it's as, if, as one author writes, it's as if he's saying, remember me sitting with you in fellowship. Remember me being betrayed and knowing all along. Remember me giving thanks to the God who ordained all of it. Remember me breaking the bread just as I willingly gave my own body to be broken. Remember me shedding my blood for you so that you might live because I died. Remember me suffering to obtain for you all the blessings of the new covenant, the new deal, the new agreement between God and humanity. Let the memories of me in the fullness of my love and power flood your soul at the table. But what do we really need to remember? I want us to focus on two words that I think are most significant to remember. Yes, again, I know the essence of the remembrance is that Jesus, this is his body, this is his blood. Yes. But there are two words I want you to remember amidst that reality. The first is the word together. Together. Verse 33, which we had included as part of our scripture reading today, says, So then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together. Part of the reason we didn't spell out the reason, uh, part of which we didn't do so uh, thus far, was spell out the reason why Paul wrote, why Paul spent so much time wanting to elicit remembrance. Um, verses 20, 70 to 22 being a little bit of the negative side of what was happening in the church in Corinth. Let me read that for our attention right now and why the word together is so important. Because he says this in verse 17, it starts out really blunt. In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. So then, when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat. For when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. Paul doesn't hold back, does he? As I said before, his letter to the church in Corinth wasn't all rainbows and lollipops. There was a lot going on that wasn't good that he needed to correct. There was a lot of problems in that early church. We think the early church had it all together, but the church in Corinth showed the reality was something very different. They struggled with understanding the deeper things of God and putting them into practice in a way that didn't give in to the practices and ways of the world. 
And so he writes to, to, to correct the things that we're not honoring to God. At the same time, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians is also filled with rich treasures on how we can overcome the challenges that face us, whether great or small, and truly be the church. There's this mix of what is right and what is wrong what we can, and what we can do to correct what is wrong. And one of those things that we can do to correct what is wrong has to do with this word, together. From the beginning of the early church as it, as it, as it was instituted and we read of in Acts chapter 2, it was customary for the believers to come together and eat together, to break bread together, to remember the Lord together. It was an opportunity for fellowship, and it was an opportunity, by the way, for sharing with those who were less privileged. Uh, and no doubt, in my mind, that they climaxed that meal by observing the Lord's Supper in some similar way that we do today. They called it the love feast, since its main emphasis was showing love for one another, as John chapter 13 refers to, the new commandment that Jesus gave them to love one another. This love feast, this agape feast, the Greek word for love, was part of the worship in Corinth. But some serious abuses had crept in. And so Paul bluntly states in the following directives, I have no praise for you. Back in verse 2, you see, the context says, I praise you for remembering me in everything and for holding to the traditions just as I passed them on to you. But now, concerning the love feast, I actually don't have any praise for you. Because, as Paul writes, they were doing more harm than good. For one thing, it seems evident that there were various cliques or factions based on socioeconomic standing, probably, within the church, people uh, who only ate with their crowd, whatever their crowd happened to be, instead of fellowshipping with the whole church as family together. And interesting, when Paul, that while Paul condemned what was happening, he did take a slightly positive view of the results in verse 19, when she says, well, yeah, maybe perhaps God will use this to show which of you he really have God's approval. That's, that's a zinger of a statement. But he describes the selfishness. Those with plenty brought a great deal of food for themselves while the poorer members went hungry. The original idea of the agape feast was sharing, but that idea had been lost. Some of the members were even getting drunk. Probably this love feast was the only decent meal some of the poorer members would have regularly had. And to be so terribly treated by richer members of the congregation, of the crowd, of the church, would not only hurt their stomachs, but their psyche and their spiritual well-being. It cut to the heart and cut them down. They forgot to strive to be one. What a rich warning for us in the 21st century, don't you think? A reminder that, yes, we are diverse. We are a multi-ethnic congregation. So we talk about the fact that many nations, two congregations, one church, Broadmoor, diverse in ethnicity, diverse in gifting, diverse in socioeconomic standing, diverse in community standing, diverse in many, many, many other ways as well. Yet, we are to strive to be one together. Which is why, by the way, there are so many of the one another or together passages in the New Testament. Because the Holy Spirit is inspired the writers to write knowing that humanity has a tendency to go the other way and always need a reminder to remember of the things that are important, including doing things together. You probably noticed that while we did participate, if you were able to come to one of our driving services and we did participate in the, in the table together, even though we were in our cars, we did so because we were together in the same place we have not done that via our YouTube channel. And that's been intentional. Some of you may have a different opinion of it, 
But for me, it's because of this rich word, together. While I'm grateful that we've been able to provide the regular uh, teaching and encouragement and worship each week via YouTube, it just didn't seem right in my heart to have communion when we were all viewing it separately at different times and in different ways. We weren't together, and so that's why we haven't done that. Moving forward, as we return to a, a clearer sense of normalcy uh, and what the, that will look like, it will include being able to be together and do things together. And that focus around the table is a key to remembering the important things as a people of God. Verse 33, let me read it again just for our benefit here today. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together. That's the first word. The second word I want you to remember is the word presence. Not presence, P-R-E-S-E-N-T-S, as in gifts we get, but presence, P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E. In this time of being apart and being unable to participate in, this, in, in the meal together, in, in fellowship together, and in the Lord's table together, we were not without the Lord's presence. So please recognize that. We may not have been able to worship in person or be present to other people in ways we typically have, but that does not mean that God was not with us. Indeed, he was. And in fact, I suspect that some, perhaps even more than I imagine, have come to realize deeper and have a greater appreciation of the presence of God as a result of separation during pandemic restrictions. That you have come to a deeper sense that God is with you. If you haven't, I'm not saying that, those other, that, that other people are, are better than you are. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying I suspect that some of you have come to this recognition. And if you haven't, let me, let me remind you. Scripture says, Jesus says, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. His presence with us. His presence with us by, by, by the presence of his Holy Spirit in our lives. A deeper understanding and appreciation of God's presence is a key to remembering in the moment of celebrating around the table. Let me remind you of a train of thought that I have shared uh, in a previous statement. Uh, there's nothing new under the sun anyway, so it's okay for me to re remind you of things I've said before. Besides, I don't, always ex I don't expect you to remember everything I say. So here's your reminder to remember using the language of last week. In his book, uh, Faithful Presence, Seven Disciplines That Shape the Mission for the Church, author David Fitch asserts that the discipline of the Lord's table is foundational and shapes a community into God's faithful presence. It's just, uh, the table is not just something we act out. God's faithful presence shapes us through participation in the table. Be aware of his presence. Be present to his presence presence. The fact that uh, Corinthian believers were sick and dying, as verses 29 and 30 describe, um, is probably because they had a disregard for the real presence of Christ around the table. They were not participating in a divine moment. They were simply eating and drinking and forgetting all the rest. As Fitch goes on to write, he says, if we can recognize his presence at work around the table, we will be able to recognize his work in the rest of our lives as well. When we have a disregard for discerning Christ's presence at the table, we will not likely discern his presence at work in the world. It starts at the table. It's a deep and rich moment at the table. We... we we must tend to his special presence because his presence always brings the reordering of our lives together into his kingdom. Fitch goes on. This is what makes the table so revolutionary at the core. Here, God shapes a people to be his kingdom in the world. Stop right there. Stop right there. 
His presence reorders our lives together in his kingdom. There it is, our two words. Together, presence. The table trains us to discern Christ's presence, not only here, but in all other places we will eat the rest of the week. Shapes us, his people, together to be his kingdom people in the world. Christ's presence in us and with us. His presence that that is real and experienced and given as a reminder through the table to shape us together as his kingdom people. Do we make space for his presence? Are we present to his presence? How do we lead others in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, into the presence of God? Or has God just become an intellectual exercise we, ex- uh, we go through uh, rather than experience? Have we forgotten the importance of the word together? The table and all that it represents leads us into unity of fellowship. All division and personal agendas get tossed aside in Christ's presence. We come equally and we come as one. The table really grounds zero for his faithful presence. We go out from that place in the power of his might and become his presence and influence in the world around. So don't think of the table just as something you do every now and then as part of the gatherings that you quickly add on at the end of the service before you get to the coffee and cookies kind of moment. It's not just something we act out as if God has nothing to do with it. Instead, realize we're participating in a divine moment with rich reward. So let the table always remind you that you are will never be the same again. Behold, he is making all things new, even you, and that you are never alone. And now that things are reopening in our province, seek opportunity to break bread together with others, with appropriate measures, of course, and be the presence of the Lord and his kingdom people together presence. Remember.
never the same again because of what Jesus has done for us. So remember, together, his presence. Words that I want you to hold on to and live. And now hear these words of benediction. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.